Well, I think I got time for one more, maybe, or a couple more. Well, I'll give one more, and then if you have any questions, I'll give you some time for questions. But this story is a true story. Now, when I go around and uh, I talk to people, I always talk about my grandfather. I mean, he was a profound influence in my life, and uh, you know, he was an influence among a lot of Native people, and uh, he was one of the best educators, storytellers around. And um, other than talking about Native history, Native culture, and um, you know, correct a lot of the, the wrongs, the, the things that were written about Native people, you know, um, that was his mission in life, was to re-educate, you know, people. Because there's a lot of misconceptions about Native people. And it's one of the stereotypes that, um, for the most part, seems to be acceptable in American culture. You know, you just turn on the TV, you watch uh, a baseball game. You know, the Cleveland Indians, they were, there's an Indian mascot. You know, Washington Redskins, you know, Atlanta Braves. And all the caricatures are Native. You know, sometimes they, they'd hit a home run, and they'd pound on that drum, and they'd do this ooh thing. I'll tell you one thing, I've never seen one Indian my whole life do this. <laughs> <laughs> never. <laughs> but it's, uh, and what it is, it's just uh, the educational system in this country. And, uh, you know, it, it's lacking in educating uh, uh, the youth about the original people of this continent and what happened. Because what happened is a black eye in American history. And, that, and that's another lecture. But uh, anyways, my grandfather, he grew up during a time when, uh, um, that wasn't being taught in school, in, uh, especially to Native kids. So these Native kids were growing up um, not knowing our culture, not knowing these stories, because it wasn't promoted in schools. In some cases, it wasn't promoted at home. Um, in a lot of uh, cases, there was um, these agents in the United States and Canada, they go around to Indian reservations and kidnap children and um, bring them to these schools, uh, boarding schools, they call them residential schools. And what it was is they were trying to deal with what they called the Indian problem. It's because Native people had a hard time adopting or uh, understanding American society or Western society because it was very different than ours. Our concepts were different. Even ownership of land was very different. You know, no individual can own land. You know, everybody, you can't own it. You know, it's like saying, this is my heir. Don't touch it. You know, it's everybody's. You know, and we're going to die. We'll go back to it and it'll be our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. You know, so those concepts are very different. And so what they wanted to do as a policy was to educate these kids to think a more Western way, you know, so they could become good American citizens or Canadian. And what that did is it destroyed a culture. Because these young, uh, influential kids would go to these schools, and if they spoke their own language, they were punished severely. You know, imagine a, a kindergarten age that doesn't speak Russian or another language and all they know is English. And if you speak English and try to communicate, you're beat. Imagine what that does to your mind. And so, and my grandmother went through that too. And um, you know, that's, that was her first language. And uh, she got forced by, with the ruler to learn English. And they would even take soap and they'd wash your mouth out with soap. And in the Southwest, they'd take hot tamales and hot peppers and they put it into the kid's mouth if they spoke their own language. And so, and the things that they were taught you know, reading, writing, arithmetic, you know, math, all the things that, you know, American society dictates that it would make you a good person. That's what they taught. They didn't teach these stories. They didn't teach our songs, our culture, our language. They didn't teach any of that. And so these young kids, they grow up with all this, and they go back to the reservation. They'd say, I'm not teaching my kids that. It's no good. You know, it's... And so it was almost gone in that sense. Uh, during that time from, you know, like the early 1900s all the way up to the 70s is when the last one closed uh, in Canada. And my mother was almost kidnapped from uh, her home. Because uh, what they would do, these Indian agents would go around and they'd look for uh, uh, a family with one parent. You know, if the husband was gone or died, you know, then they'd take, they'd take the kids. And I guess this one Indian agent went to my mother's house. And my grandfather had gone to Montreal to look for work. But I guess he couldn't find any. In, uh, these Indian agents said, we're going to come tomorrow and we'll take the kids. And so they came back, but luckily during that night, my grandfather came home and he had his gun. <laughs> you know, he's, get out of here. You know, because he, he loved his family, of course, but that's, that was the policy. And that's a little, little known in the United States history, what happened. It also happened in Hawaii, Australia, the Philippines, all around the world. Um, and it's a, a, a part of history that's it's pretty dark. And it's a fairly recent history. And that... So those kids grew up ashamed and they forgot their culture. 
And my grandfather, he didn't go to a residential school. And he knew the culture. He knew the importance that it was disappearing. And so he took it upon himself to teach those kids. And he taught school at Tuscarora Reservation and Akwazasne Reservation. And there, he had to be sneaky about it because it wasn't policy to promote our culture. And so what he would do, he would wait until uh, the kids, if they did all their work and they were good, he'd tell them the last 15, 10, 15 minutes of class, I'll tell you a story. And of course, kids love stories. And so at that time, they closed the shades and they had to have a lookout out in the hallway for the principal because he was opposed to that, you know, anything cultural. And so he would tell them stories. And so what he was doing, he was, he was doing was planting that seed of knowledge of our own culture. And a lot of those young kids, you know, of course, now they're great grandparents, they're great, you know, grandparents and great grandparents, but those young people grew up to be proud of who they were for a change. Uh, and they taught their children and people start to do traditional ceremonies again and promoting it and our culture is thriving now. You know, it's back and it's very strong. You know, there's political differences, but that's where isn't it? You know, there's always going to be political trouble, but our core is strong. So he grew up during that time, and when he got his whole life, though, he loved the Adirondacks, and he loved the natural world, he loved the animals, and he stopped hunting because he just couldn't kill anymore. As, even as he was in his 20s, he just said, I can't kill anything. And so he became an advocate for uh, animals. You know, and there was a saying by an Onondaga, he says, you know, at the United Nation, he says, I don't see a seat for the animals who are speaking on their behalf, who's speaking for the bear, who's speaking for the feathered animals, who's speaking for the creatures that live in the oceans. Where's their seat in this United Nations? You know, there isn't, they don't have a voice. And so it's up to indigenous native cultures to provide that voice. And so my grandfather was one of those voices and um, he just loved animals too. And he had a way, special way with animals. And I've, I've witnessed it in my life. And um, behind his house, he used to feed the bears years ago. They used to have a landfill down the road. And of course, black bears, they, that's where they go and eat and uh, they get used to it. And uh, they, they closed that dump, they covered it up. And then uh, my grandfather, he used to hang up, uh, you know those little cages, you put suet and meat in it, hang it up for the, I think the woodpeckers, they like that. Every morning you get up and it's gone. You, know, you look in the woods and you see it all ripped open and just about mangled and get a new one, hang it up. Next morning, it's gone. And finally, there's one morning he got up and he said, I wonder who's stealing. He thought it was a raccoon, but he looked out and it was a black bear. And the bear was taking it and he looked at it and it was real thin, skinny. And so he felt sorry for them. And so he took um, his truck, he went down to the, uh, I think it was a bakery, and they had that day old stuff they'd throw away. And he just loaded up his truck and put it out back. And, uh, and that was the opening of Ray Fadden's restaurant. <laughs> Ray Fad's restaurant was open for about 40 years, <laughs> but um, he got to know those bears and I've seen it, I used to help him, and uh, at one point we, we could identify and differentiate 20 bears that would come every night, and I remember this one bear, he had his paw cut off from a bear trap, and uh, he was dying, he was in a bad way, he was really skinny, uh, even his hair was coming out, and uh, he, he would limp, you know, because he didn't have a paw. And of course, I named him Limpy, you know, you know original. But uh, we all thought he was going to die. And I don't know how my grandfather did it, but somehow he was able to communicate to that bear to come at a certain time of night when all the other bears had eaten and left. Because that little, that young bear with the missing paw never got anything to eat because the, bear, the other bears would chase him away and, uh, because he was wounded. But he actually taught that bear how to knock on the door. And I was there, I was in the living room once and uh, he just bang, bang, bang in the back door, in the screen door on his porch. And he went out and he goes, hold on a minute. And he went down to the basement and pulled out this, uh, uh, I think it was suet. He would collect uh, that meat that they throw out. You know, a lot of times you collect that and he'd give it to that bear and it was that bear with the, the paw cut off. And that mother bear, she was really small. She looked like a cub. And she could never get any food either because all those bigger bears would eat everything up and they'd chase her away. And he taught her how to knock on the door too. Don't know how he did it. And I was there one night and bang, 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 and bang. And we went out and we looked and she took the door right down though. <laughs> but it was a screen door, so it was all right. And he's like, 
And I just remember him going like this, like a little bit lighter. <laughs> but it would, uh, it would knock on the door. But he always had a way with the animals. And uh, even um, people would get an injured animal, a bird, they always brought it to my grandfather because they knew he had a way. He could nurture it back to health. And uh, back, I think now they call it wildlife rehabilitators. You know, you have to get a license and all this, but back then he didn't need one of those. And they just, he just knew how to take care of them. And like growing up, I can remember we had raccoons, and we had a skunk once, owl, hawks, uh, woodchucks, various animals that were wounded. And um, in most cases, he'd nurture them back to health and let them go. But um, well, anyways, that was another passion in his life for years. He just loved animals, and he had a connection. And uh, most, a lot of people don't have that. It's like a gift, almost. And, uh, and I can remember even watching him walk down the road. He'd go like this with his arms, and this hawk would swoop down right by him and go off. You know, and I was just like, how does he do that? And I'm sitting there going like this, and nothing, you know? <laughs> and nothing wanted to come. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyways, he taught school in uh, Akwazasne for a number of years, and uh, my father graduated high school, went off to college, and then my grandfather moved to the mountains, and he ended up finishing out his teaching career in Saranac, down in the south of Plattsburgh. And, um, and there is 1954 is when he established the museum, the Six Nations Indian Museum, and it's still there today. And uh, from time to time, you get visitors from the reservation will come up. And we still get visitors. They always come up and they want to hear a story. And uh, but a lot of cases, my grandfather was there, they'd want to see him because he was the best storyteller. And this one day, this car pulls up. And my grandfather looked out the window. And he saw this family get out. And he recognized one of the young, uh, young person, young boy, uh, as one of his former students from the reservation. And the young boy had this little box. He was carrying this box, and he was like, oh, that's funny. So he went out and he greeted them, and they walked up the steps up to his house. And my grandfather said, hello, how's it going? He says, what's in the box? And then this little boy says, I found this in the woods, and I brought it. I don't know what to do with it. I, get, I thought you might know. And so my grandfather said, what is it? And he opened it up, and he looked inside. Inside was a baby porcupine about that big around. Little thing, little guy. And he says, where did you find him? He says, yeah, I was walking through Laffin's woods, and I saw him sitting on a rock all by himself. I looked around. There's no mother, so I took him home. And I, he said, when was this? He goes, it was yesterday. And he says, he slept on my pillow last night, and he's all proud. And then my grandfather says, no, oh, you should have left him alone. Because a lot of animals, they instruct their young to sit still, don't move, and they'll go off and get food. You know, even a deer. The mother will make all kinds of noise, bounce around, jump in the air, distract whoever's there. And then if you look around, you'll see a fawn, like a statue, won't move. And she, my grandfather said that porcupine's mother was probably right around there somewhere. You know, you should have left it alone. And it's too late to bring him back because it's been too long. She's probably took off. And plus there's that different smell, you know, human scent. And they might not take care of it. And he says, well, we'll see what we can do. And so they visited for a while, and then that family went back home to Akwazasne, and my grandfather, he looked at that porcupine, and he thought, well, most times a baby that young, it was little, says they don't make it. You know, all animals, they, they need their mother. And, um, you know, a lot of cases, they just don't live. They might live a day or two, and that's it. But he's looking at that porcupine, and he goes, well, let's give it a shot. He says, what do porcupines eat? And he's thinking, he goes, well, let's try warm milk for, you know, starters. So he got some milk, put it in a little pan, put it on the fire, not too hot. Just let it get a little warm, and he put it on his wrist, just like he would a baby. And then he put it in a little eyedropper, because he was so small. And a few drops in there, picked up that little porcupine, and one drop at a time. And that little porcupine grabbed hold of it, and it started drinking that milk. And he was like, boy, that's a good sign. And it was hungry too, so he made a little more, a little more milk, and then finally he got tired, went to sleep, put it back in the box. He says, hmm, that's good. Then he's put it in his room and then sat down watching the news. Then he hears his, eh, eh, his cry. It wasn't even an hour later. He's hungry again. So he got up, warmed up the milk, got the eyedropper, a few more drops, and he went back to sleep, put him back in the box, laid down. Eh, hour later, he's crying. Every hour on the hour, that little porcupine was hungry. But he was eating, which was good. And so day went by, he was still alive. Another day, he was still there. And he was moving around more, and his eyes were bright. Third day, fourth day, turned into a week, and he was still there. You know, this is great. 
he was happy. And so finally they said, well, he's been here a while. We got to name him. And they talked it over. And he says, Needles. That's fitting for a porcupine. So they named him Needles. Now Needles, uh, he looked at my grandfather like that was his mother. And everywhere my grandfather went, there was Needles following him around because that's where his food came from. And when he got bigger, he, uh, you know, he was a big guy. He would always climb up on my grandfather's back and he would wrap his arms around his neck, you know, and hang out like a piggyback. And uh, my grandfather would walk around with that porcupine on his back and, uh, and he'd go down, down the road for a walk with this porcupine on his back and you see these cars drive by just about going all over the road. <laughs> see this crazy old guy with this porcupine on his back. And, uh, and when my grandfather would go to town, of course, Needles had to go. And my uh, grandfather get in his truck and he'd sit down and he'd start her up and Needles get on his lap. And uh, I don't know if you know how like dogs, they got to see what's going on. Needles, porcupines do the same thing. They got to see what's going on. And so Needles would hop up on the steering wheel, grab on and look and see. <laughs> <laughs> and so all these cars driving by again, and he'd be like, whoa, there's a porcupine driving this truck. And he'd go and he'd go to the post office with Needles on his back and people would be looking at him and taking pictures. and. There's even newspaper articles written about him. People would interview him, all kinds of pictures. And to my grandfather, that was just his buddy. And, but to Needles, my grandfather was his mother. And so they were close. Now, Needles, when he was a little guy, you know, a little baby, and he went to the bathroom, it wasn't too bad. You know, just a little bit there and easy to clean up. You know, not too bad. But he started to eat solid foods. It wasn't so pretty. <laughs> Guess what his favorite food was? Burnt toast. <laughs> no butter, it had to be black. You had to cook it until it's just about smoking. And he loved it, he would eat it up. And he would eat uh, four or five at a time, burnt toast. It might be because it resembled bark, I don't know. Because that's what they eat is bark. But uh, his other favorite food was bananas. He would eat a banana, peel and all. He didn't peel it, he'd just eat the whole thing. He'd eat five or six of those. Now needles, when he went to the bathroom after eating that, <laughs> it wasn't so pretty. Now, my grandfather's the type of guy, he could live with it, he doesn't care. You know, most guys are like that, you know. But my grandmother lived there too. <laughs> and she said, Ray, she says, we gotta figure something out. And so they talked it over and over, and they says, well, why don't we try a litter pen? You know, like you would a cat, you know, worth a shot. And so they got a pan and he put some sand and little pebbles in it and looked around and there was a good spot in the bathroom under the sink. And there was a good, you know, put it there. Now you just have to wait for the next accident. And so, didn't take long, there it was right in the middle of the living room carpet. Needles, get over here. So needles come over and like you do a cat, you know, you train a cat and you kind of scold it and you rub its nose in it and then you show it to the litter pan. And eventually they learn that's where you go to the bathroom. So my grandfather, he grabbed the porcupine very carefully, pick him up, and he had bad needles, rub his nose in it, and show him to the litter pan underneath the sink in the bathroom. And wait, and wait, and wait, and then nothing. Next day, there's another one, do it again. Day after day, it took two weeks to teach him. But eventually, needles didn't have any more accidents. He learned that's where you go to the bathroom, under the sink. In the, in the bathroom. You know, who would have known you could train a porcupine? I would have never guessed. But he learned it. And now Needles, you know, he was a special guy. And uh, my grandfather, uh, he overfeeds everything. You know, he, like his cat, he used to have that thing was about that big around. And he goes, oh, you hungry? And, you know, and, uh, those bears in the fall, their bellies would rub on the ground. And I'm surprised the birds could fly. He'd feed them so much. And uh, Needles was no different. He was this big porcupine. He was about, I think they said 45 pounds. And the normal was about 25. So about, he was big. Now Needles, this one night, my grandfather went to bed. He turned off the light and he's closed his eyes. He's just drifting off and he hears this really pitiful cry. He said, what is that? Turned his light on, he looked over. And there's Needles on his back legs looking out the window. He's like, what's the matter, Needles? And he looked, got up, and he turned on the outside light, and he looked, and there were other porcupines out there. And he's like, oh, his heart sank. And he's like, this isn't right. You know, it's like, it's like taking an eagle and putting it in a hen coop. You know, just isn't right. And he just felt so guilty what he had done. You know, he was selfish, because he, you know, 
liked that little guy or big guy. But anyways, Needles was crying and he knew he was upset. And then he says he should be out there. And so he waited to talk to my grandmother and that next morning. They talked it over and, uh, well, it's probably the best thing. And so took a deep breath and he opened up the back door and opened up the screen door on the porch and Needles took off like a dart. He was so happy, he was free and he took off and he disappeared over the hill. He was gone. My grandfather closed the door and he was moping around all day long. He was really sad. It was like one of their kids went off to college. You know, what do you do? It's an empty house. And so they're walking around, walking around. Then my grandfather got thinking, you know, because he's been inside too long. You know, this is where we raised him, pretty much indoors. And he remembered his neighbor, he traps beaver. And he set traps down the road a mile or two. And he says, oh, needles, he might, he doesn't know about that. He might get his foot stuck in there. We'll never know. And he started to worry, and he goes, he's, he's a smart porcupine, but he doesn't know enough about the road, you know. He's always in a car, now on the road. And uh, he said, he's just worrying about all these things. Every time a car would go by, go, oh, you get nervous. And so he got up, and he went into the woods, up and down the road, looking for needles. Needles all around. About a five-mile radius in the woods he went, looking around, no sign of him, nothing. Up and down the road, looking in the ditches, no sign of needles. He was gone. And it was getting dark. The sun was setting, and he couldn't sleep. You know, he would try to go to bed. Every car that would go by, his heart would sink. You know, oh, he'd get so worried. Till finally, about midnight, my grandmother handed him a flashlight. Get out there and keep looking. So my grandfather took that flashlight up and down the road, looking in the ditches, needles. He heard a noise, he looked over, oh, it's just a raccoon. Keep going, looking around, rustling around, oh, it's just a bear. Keep on going, rustling around, oh, it's a porcupine. Oh, it's skinny, it's not him. <laughs> so he keep looking all night long, he looked and looked and looked, no sign of needles, he was gone. So he finally made it home, he was tired. He made some coffee, he figured he'd stay up. Sun was just coming up early morning, you know, probably five o'clock in the morning, just that light. Faintly hear the birds starting to chirp. My grandfather sat down with his coffee at the kitchen table and me, I opened the door, he opened up his uh, back door and there's a screen porch and you can, he's looking out back. And he's sitting there sipping his coffee half asleep and he looked and up on the hill, something was moving. You could see the ferns rustling. Put his coffee down, he got up, looked out, got a little closer, he rubbed his eyes. Whatever it is, it was coming down this way, going down that trail. And he listened, he could hear branches snapping, and he could see these ferns going like this. And then finally, into the clearing, there he was. He was alive, he could see him, he was big. And he looked like he had little legs because he was so big. And here comes Needles down the trail, running as fast as those little legs could carry him, going down that trail. And my grandfather was so relieved as that weight was lifted. He called out my grandmother, Christine, that's my grandmother's name. Needles made it. She was wide awake anyway. She got up and oh, what a relief. Here he comes down the trail. My grandfather opened up the screen door and he was getting ready to give him the biggest hug he ever had. Got right there. Here comes Needles. He's going about 100 miles an hour. Here he comes barreling down that trail. Ferns kicking in the air, branches in the air, pine needles, pine cones. Everything on the ground was being kicked in the air. And here he comes. Grandfather's just getting ready to pick him up. And what does Needles do? Runs up the steps, runs right between his legs, right past him, doesn't even look at him, right up on the porch. And there's my grandmother, standing there ready to pick him up. Just about knocked her over. How rude. He's going about 110 now. Goes up into the kitchen, to going about 115. Takes a hard left down the hallway, bounces off the wall, off another wall. Going about 120, goes into the bathroom under the sink where his litter pan was. <laughs> That actually happened. It's a true story. Mm -hmm. Now, if you get a chance and you get to the museum, in the first room when you walk in, if you look to the left, you'll see pictures of bears, and on the top, you'll see needles. He's up there. Yeah. I mean, he's probably one of the most famous porcupines in the world. <laughs> but I guess my grandfather said by the time he was done, there was a puddle about that big. <laughs> okay, folks, have any questions? How long ago was that? It's before I was born. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't a question, but I just thought I'd tell you that uh, 
when I was about eight years old, my mother used to take us on rides on Saturdays and Sundays, and we went on this ride. I lived down near Lake George. We went on this long ride, and eventually we came to the um, yeah to Antioda mm -hmm. to the museum, and it was closed. Oh. And, but my mother said, well, I think the man lives right near here. She had heard about your grandfather. So we went to the house right across the street, and I remembered it and everything, knocked on the door. He came over, opened up the museum, showed us through the museum and everything. And years and years later, when I, you know, just like 20 years ago or something, I found the museum again. I, I didn't even know, you know, I was like eight years old. I had no idea where it was. And when we went, when I drove by it, I said, I was here when I was a kid. And I remembered your grandfather's house. I remembered oh, the museum and everything. Mm -hmm. And then we got to go through it again then. Oh, so cool. it was really nice memory from, yeah. and your grandfather was very, very nice. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a good story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My husband wanted me to tell you that he was, he knew your grandfather. Cool. Um, he, he's an, uh, he has a huge collection of Indian relics. Oh, nice. And he and your father used to talk quite often on the phone about them and things. And um, they were both in an article on um, Adirondack Lake one time. Your grandfather and my husband and a couple other people were in this article about their relics and things. So he also knew is John your father? That's my father. Yeah. Okay, yeah. you knew your you worked with your father. Oh, also. nice. Yeah. Um, at the prison though, he said. Yeah, I used to teach. Yeah, okay. He didn't go to prison. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, no, my husband was a correction officer, but you said your father was a teacher, and I didn't. Yeah. Think yeah. Being a teacher. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's good. You got a question? Well, not a question, but I'm an author and illustrator. Really, both. I'm just an illustrator. Keep it up. Someday it'll be up here. <laughs> John, any exhibits or your paintings this summer anywhere? Uh, just at our museum. Um, yeah, I'm also an illustrator and I, I do uh, uh, paintings, acrylic paintings, and I have. I haven't had uh, enough time this past winter to paint. You know, I, it's one of my passions is painting. And I do a lot of uh, native imagery of uh, portraits of native people. And my imagery of natives is a little different than most in that native people are actually smiling, you know? <laughs> because, uh, you know, you look at a, you know, do any Google search of uh, Native American, it's always, you know, you know, staring off into the sunset, you know, is that romanticized? And, but I realized when I was younger that none of them smile. They're always so serious and angry and mad. And it's like my, my experience, my household, I go up to the reservation, my grandmother's house, all my aunts, and we'd all get together, and it was just booming of laughter. You know, everybody's, you know, eating and cooking and telling stories and jokes and teasing each other, and there's that, you know, we're humans. You know, we're not these all serious, stoic icons and, uh, you know, mascots, I guess. But, so I started painting portraits of Native people that have smiles. And so, in the first painting I did of a smiling Indian, it, it looked like he was grimacing. <laughs> so it took a little while to get the hang of painting smiles, but uh, but I have shows from time to time, but not lately. Last couple of years, not too much. Uh, it seems like it persisted a lot longer with the pictures of the natives. But if you go back to the mid 1800s and earlier, nobody smiled nope. <laughs> like uh, ever. And one reason was um, that the, the long the shutter speed was so long. Another reason people didn't have very good teeth, mm -hmm. uh, so it's hard to hold a smile if you even if you had teeth to actually show off. And then, then of course I think you know after photography came in more, I think you know you had the you wanted to have the image of the savage so that stayed longer. But mm -hmm. but we get some we got some relatives and it says underneath uh, this woman there and it says poof the hair a little like that ain't gonna help her. <laughs> yeah. Ain't not gonna help yeah. her. <laughs> yeah, I, I realize that too. That is. Yeah, if you move it, the image is a, a blur. Yeah. Like you'll see some people standing there and you see this blur, it was probably a dog or something, yeah. or, or a baby. Yeah. You know, a lot of times you see a baby. If you get a full standing pose, they actually had, what they call it, the torture device, instrument of torture. It would actually fit behind your head. And you hold your stomach. And, and so as a base, sometimes in the bottom of pictures, you can see this base, and so like, they look like really <laughs> stiff or terrified, and mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> but that's, and then, then contemporary artists would take that imagery and that's all they knew. They right, never seen right. native people smiling. And uh, yeah, that's a good point. Where are your books available? 
Online, uh, I have books on order, but it, I thought I was hoping to get them by today, but it, probably tomorrow. But you um, can get them on Amazon. Yeah, Amazon. You know, you just yeah. Google my name. Okay. It will come up. Yeah. I was wondering when you first was speaking in the beginning, um, when you mentioned that your mom was in a wolf clan. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how many clans are they, and if every clan has a reason for calling, for example, a wolf or mm -hmm. Your dad was turtle, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there are nine major clans among the Six Nations. And um, you can remember them by thinking of the sky, the land, and the water. And from the sky, you have the hawk, the heron, and the snipe, like those birds. Those are the, those clans. And from the land, you have the deer, the wolf, and the bear. And from the water, you have the beaver, the eel, and the turtle. And those are the nine major families of the Iroquois. And, um, there used to be more, but over time they've kind of like melded into one, you know, like one clan. Like there used to be three different wolf clans, uh, like a fox and a coyote and a, uh, you know, the timber wolf. But over time it melded into just wolf and the different kinds of turtles. And the identity, how that came into be was from our, uh, another story, one of our creation in that. Um, there was a, well, this is another long story, but the short version is that the women were, were instructed to, in the morning, go get a drink of water. And, um, and if, when they dip their ladle with the current in the water, the first thing that you see when you look up, that will be your name. And so the women would look up and there was a deer, or uh, maybe one saw an eel. And so in, a, in my lineage, it was a wolf. And we're talking beginning of time you know, this creation story. But uh, in that, in a sense, um, also gave us a mechanism to help deal with uh, death. You know, when a family member dies, the family, you know, the family just is on the ground. But the other clan, they didn't lose anybody. And so it's their job and their responsibility to do all the work, to do the funeral, the, the, you know, take care of the, all that, so that the, the mourning people won't have to work. So. But there's a lot more to it than that. <laughs> Good question. Any other questions? I have one actual little question, and it's hard to articulate. Um, but one thing that impressed me while I was listening to your stories was whether you were talking about your grandfather's story or the story about the peacemaker, which, mm -hmm. as you dated, could be back a thousand years ago. You you had a way of make, telling these stories so that they seemed just that they had just happened, that maybe they were your grandfathers. There was a real connection and an imminence to what you were saying. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if that was a conscious choice that you as a storyteller made, or is that just the way you heard it and you're recreating it? Because you kept saying this happened long ago, but when I was responding to your story, it really felt like you had just heard the story and it, it just felt there was a closeness to the, to the telling of the story. And I wasn't sure if that was something that you had um, managed, <laughs> or if this was something that you'd Well, it wasn't a, a conscious decision to do that. I mean, that's just yeah. my style. That's the way I heard it. That's the way my grandfather and my father tell stories. Uh, you know, and, and like any good story, you're there. Yeah. You know, any, you know, you get a movie with a billion dollar budget. If the story's not there, it doesn't matter. But if you got a, sto a movie that's an excellent story, you're in there. You're right there. You know, you can sympathize with the characters, and like any good book, you know, if you can identify with certain parts, you know, it's more. It's just that closeness that you get, and you become part of it. And with storytelling, it's not a conscious decision, but it's more like, uh, in my mind, I'm there. I guess is the saying, you know. And I've heard it, and I've visualized it. I like these stories. I never read them, you know. I've heard them. And in my mind, it, when it comes out of my mouth, I've interpreted it maybe a little differently. And uh, so that's, you know, to your, answer your question, it wasn't a conscious decision. It's just the way I do it. You seem to talk like a Frenchman. Where does that come from? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's part reservation accent and part Adirondack accent. So I guess there's a, it comes out bonjour. <laughs> Around yeah. yeah, like they got a twang. Yeah, mm -hmm. so yeah. That. yeah. it was hard to get used to. Mm -hmm. yeah. In some places, it's even more. It's hard to understand. And after yeah. 20 years, you learn it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I've been on the res, you know, close to 20 years, so it's like 
you know, I pick up some of that, and then there's, I go home, and you know, some of my friends have that around that twang, and so I start talking like them, and you know, I end up going to the south, and I start talking like them. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah, um, I have a question. Uh, with the influence of technology and internet, how do you see native storytelling surviving in communities? Like, do you see that it's harder to keep that out? Mm. Well, there's a, a positive and negative to that. Uh, the positive is that you can reach more people, you know, through Skype or, uh, you know, Facebook. But that's a positive for, you know, more people can, you have access to more people. The negative is it's meant to be person to person. You know, you're meant to see the person, you know, within a few feet, you know, not a computer screen. You know, so that's kind of a negative. Um, like, I don't think I would have evolved into a storyteller if I only heard them on the Internet. You know, it's different. There's a different feel. You know, there's uh, you you tend to remember things more you know, with association. Like, with a lot of time to tell stories, I, I, you know, especially at the museum, there's certain smells there that trigger these memories of uh, my grandfather telling these stories, and I'll tell it differently because of that. Um, whereas on the internet, it's different. You know, so there is both positive and negative. Um, like I could learn more stories by you know reading it, um, but that's a good question. So, you know, it's just like any technology. There's good things and there's bad. You know. Uh, you have a question? Uh, are the children today brought up with both languages in the home? It depends on the family. You know, um, like in my family, my mother is fluent Mohawk speaker. My father isn't. And I grew up off the reservation, so there wasn't too many Mohawk speakers around. But my first words, you know, were Mohawk. But uh, gradually, you know, English took over. But I still understand a lot, but I'm not anywhere near a fluent speaker, you know. But um, on the reservation, it all depends on the family. Uh, they teach it in school now, which is good. They have uh, language programs. Um, in some classes, they even have uh, total immersion classes for, you know, not only children, but adults. And, uh, and that's what it takes, you know, total immersion into that language to hear it. Because they've tried to write it with using the English alphabet, but it just, it's difficult. You know, there's subtle accent changes that can change the meaning of the entire word. Like my name, for example, Ganet Tegel, means patches of snow. There's another guy I met, his name is Ganet Tegel. I don't know if you heard that subtle, subtle that second yeah. syllable. Ganye and Gane. That the Gane together that means uh, fallen trees. You know, something different, totally different. And uh, just to give you an example of the subtleties of the language, it was a, a priest on the, in St. Regis, uh, part of the reservation, that, um, you know, it was this new priest and he was all excited. And, uh, you know, so he just said, I'm going to learn this language. And so he learned, you know, as best he could. And uh, he wanted to do a mass using the in Mohawk. And I guess he was ready, he thought he was ready. He practiced, 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 practiced. And finally came the day, and so he's giving his sermon in Mohawk. And apparently, I guess all the people were, he was saying things that he shouldn't say. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I guess all the women were just kind of like looking at him. And, and I guess, uh, you know, laughing. And, uh, but I guess eventually he did learn it. But, uh, but it is, it's a difficult language. Um, you know, it's. You know, between like English and Mohawk is like comparing English and Russian or, you know, Asian. You know, it's very different. You know, like I took Spanish in high school, and it was similar enough to English that you could kind of you get it pretty easily. But with Mohawk, it's different. It's all everything's reversed. And, you know. uh, in Hawaii, they have eleven uh, letters in their uh, their language. Mm -hmm. You know, in their alphabet, I guess. Mm -hmm. How many do you have? Uh, we don't have a written language, but we have. Oh. Uh, yeah, that's right. Is it twenty some syllables? And that's it. I'm not sure exact number, but um, you know, like like my name, Ga Nye Tagaelu. You know, it's those so you are have those. Have a way to write that? You could, in your language? No, it's all it's just, you know it's all spoken. But it, what I'm saying is that it was written. They use the English alphabet to try to write. And it's difficult. And um, for some reason, a lot of times, like as an example, that name Ganya Tagel, the first syllable is Ga. You think it'd be spelled G A? It's actually spelled K, K A. 
in uh, the last part, couldn't it? Like, yeah, Lu. Sounds like an L. It's actually spelled R O N. <coughs> so I don't know why that came to be, you know. Yeah. But even the, like the, the syllable J is a T S I. Uh, T is pronounced like a D more. Um, wow. Yeah, it's, it's complicated. Yeah. I was just wondering how many languages there in Native American? Because you said you speak Mohawk. So, and you mentioned there are the six nations now. Do they all speak the same language, or there's different six languages? Everything? They're different. They're different. Yeah, but um, like Giant, uh, going from east to west, you have the Mohawk and Oneida on the Dog of Seneca. Mohawks and Oneidas, very similar. You know, we're neighbors. You know, it's very, very similar. Little differences here and there. But Mohawk and Seneca is very different. But what they can do is they can communicate in a language that's like maybe Cayuga that's similar enough that they can understand it. Um, and they're close enough where you can easily get you know, the gist of what they're saying. You know, it's just like, um, you, know, in, in, you know, the Irish and Scottish and the, in England and Wales, are, it's English, but it's, there's real different sounds to it. That's the Iroquoian languages. All around us are Algonquin speakers. And that's the largest linguistic group in North America. And they extend out all the way to the Great Plains. The Plains Cree, they speak Algonquin. The Anishinaabe or the Ojibwe. Um, on the East Coast, you have the Pequot, the Narragansett, um, the Wampanoags, the Abeniki. All those people and to the south of us as well, they're all Algonquin speakers. And it's a di they're different dialects, and they can communicate. But they're very different than Iroquois. And then out west, you have uh, like the Lakotas on the Great Plain, Plains. They have different languages too. And I think there's about 300 different dialects and languages in North America. Mm -hmm. In a lot of cases, uh, when you're traveling, um, because you don't share the same language, you use sign language. And there was uh, certain ways to communicate. And as an example, my grandfather was traveling out west in, uh, I think it was Oklahoma, and uh, he traveled everywhere. They were driving along, he was a young man, and uh, he had been studying the native sign language and the various, you know, the basics, I guess, of that sign language. And he saw, the, the, I guess they saw these guys walking down the road and they pulled over and offered them a ride in, um, in their Lakotas, uh, or Sioux. And they got in and, they, you know, catching up, talking, blah, blah, blah. And they, my grandfather noticed this one guy, he just didn't say a word, he was quiet. And finally they got to their destination and they got out and finally my grandfather, uh, he saw that, he just wasn't communicating. So he, he said, do you, do you speak, do you speak Indian? Guy's eyes lit up and he's going, he's going crazy. <laughs> and then my grandfather's like, slow down, slow down, slow down. And so they communicated using that sign language. And uh, what it turns out later, he found out that that man, is, uh, he was deaf. You know? And another interesting thing is that he was Sitting Bull's grandson. And he was a famous Lakota chief that, that was his grandson. You know? And we got a picture of him. So. But he talked to him in uh, sign language. And also they would use, uh, like on trails, they use markings with pictographs uh, to communicate messages, uh, record you know, events, maybe hunting or maybe it was a battle or uh, even it's warnings. You know? uh, they'd use pictographs that were, they'd strip the bark off a tree and they'd paint on the, the bare wood. And people that would see it could decipher what was being communicated. And there was a place uh, in Central New York called Painted Post. And in that area was, uh, crossroads of trails in, in the, that area. I guess all these trees were stripped of bark. And there was images painted all of, like a bulletin board. You know, it was like, kill it was here, you know. <laughs> but it was, you know, it was all messages and using pictographs, so, yeah. I just wanted to mention something that you both brought up earlier, Jeff, about the Mohawk and the it was an Indian reservation. We used to go and watch them do little dances and find little, you know, basket things. Typical of what you've seen in books and movies. And I drive by there often now, taking the Mercier Bridge to go to Montreal. And I guess what you're saying, there's so much more pride and there's so much more opportunity for reservation people than there used to be. I remember shacks as a kid. And today they have beautiful homes, and it's such a nice thing to drive by today and know that these people living on reservations 
are living a good life. Right. You know, that that's a really yeah. great thing. Yeah. It is positive, you know, it's yeah. like, it, it is. in my family and you know, my grandmother, you know, of course a lot of people we we you know, follow the same economic trends. You know, a lot of people are hurting right now. The reservation, a lot of people are hurting right now. Um, during the depression, that was horrible. You know, people you know, but the thing with native people is that Whenever, not one person goes hungry. You know, if somebody's hungry, they feed them. You know, if everybody's starving, it's because everybody's starving. You know, you take care of each other. You know, it's just like any community. You take care of each, each other. But if uh, you know, it's just the economic conditions right now. Um, you know, Kanawagi is like you know, the people are making money various ways, but. Um, you go and further, I ask you no. Why they changed <coughs> Kakadawaga to Ganyanka? Is there a reason? Just, I mean, it used to be Kakadawaga, now it's Ganyanka. Just different pronunciation of it. Uh, oh, is it? Uh, Kakadawaga. That pronunciation was from uh, the Mohawk Valley. When they came up north, they called it uh, uh, Kakadawaga. And uh, but now it's just like the whole language is evolving. Kakadawaga. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. But there's back to your question. Uh, the Iroquois communities, um, you know, they're doing fairly well. But there's other communities that are not. You know, you go further north, there's poverty. You, you, you know, in Canada, you go out to Pine Ridge, uh, even down in the southwest, uh, you think you're in a, a third world country. You know? Yeah, Arizona. Arizona. The Navajos. Mm -hmm. We went through there two years ago. It's terrible. Yeah, yeah. Well, but how they survive. I don't know. Yeah. Any other questions in the back? Um, I met your grandfather in 1927 when I was five years old. Oh, okay. He was an independent girl. Oh. He was a guest at my, but well, the Indians had gathered in independence over my service. And uh, just last year, uh, last fall, I was introduced to your father. Oh. And uh, when uh, I was introduced to, to him and John Fadden, I asked him if he was in related to Ray. And he said, yes, that was my grandfather. Yeah. You look a lot like your grandfather. Oh, oh. <laughs> 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 yeah. I have a picture somewhere I'm trying to find it for your father, of your father, of your grandfather and my father oh. together. I'm trying to find out more. I wasn't able to make it on this trip. But when your father found out I was going to Hogensburg this weekend, he told me you were going to be here tonight. And so I, uh, I think he mentioned your name. Altered my trip to be here. Yeah. <laughs> still make the other stuff. Well, I appreciate it very much. You're an excellent storyteller. Well, secondly, it's your gesture. Oh. You're almost, you almost present it like a ballet was presented. <laughs> <laughs> you do it beautifully. I mean, uh, every expression, your hands move and so forth, and you can, the story unfolds the way you do it. Oh, thank you. Very nice job. Thank you. I, I just had a similar reaction. I, my, my, grand, my father was Italian, mm. and so talking about your hands was <laughs> a very important yeah. part. And I was loving that, the way you mm -hmm. were able to do that, too. You yeah. told the story as much visually in your hands mm -hmm. and the directions and things. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Because yeah. I have a, a cousin that lives out in the, the southwest. Uh, and he, he, I heard my grandfather when he was a young man growing up, and he's a storyteller. But he's turned it into a production. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's on stage, and he comes out playing a flute, you know, it's real dramatic, you know, like, oh, that's not me, I can't do that, so I just, the hands is as far as I go. <laughs> yeah. Very well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you all for listening.